to be here and I try to remember when I've been in Asia for the first time and it's super funny because actually exactly 10 years ago I did my first trip to Japan so it was on 20th uh, November 2004 and I took this picture with my mobile cam. Uh, it was my birthday and if you can count you might guess okay it's my birthday today so I'm quite happy to be here. Uh, I used this ent entity do Docomo Japanese phone to take a picture and it was like 320 times 240 and it was a really amazing resolution that time. <laughs> yeah, totally crazy. And if you try to remember, it was, uh, it's 10 years and there was no iPhone, there was no YouTube, there wasn't Google Maps, there was nothing. Yeah. Uh, but there was something on the server side. So JS, we heard about this. Uh, you can use it in websites. But there was already mm, like four or five years uh, where Helma was in production. So we used this on our servers. Not sure if anyone have ever used it. But it was a cool JavaScript framework that you can run on the browser. And yeah, so 10 years ago, now this conference somehow combines all this stuff. And I'm going to talk about me. Um, I'm Martin Klepper. You can find me on Twitter at MK. Um, I have my own company called Ubilabs. We are uh, located in Hamburg and do all different kind of mapping related uh, yeah, coding. So we analyze code. This is, for example, like we, we uh, calculate how far you can travel in a specific time. Um, we also work a lot for the Google Maps team in Mountain View, creating like imagery. If you have the latest Android uh, Lollipop, for example, they use our backgrounds for the system. Uh, and we do stuff like this. So I'm working during the day all the time using the Google Maps API. Um, but this talk will not be about my daily job. This will, will be more about my, my second, um, second life uh, during the dark. Um, <laughs> this is me, how I look at night. And I have a website, uh, it's called M1K, um, where you can find all my productions. And I might ask if you maybe can shut down this, this, uh, this other screen, because the next slide will be full of code, and it's, uh, I think it's important to, to see all of them. No, not this one, but the, the small one. <laughs> Get it back? OK, thanks. Um, yeah, about a year ago, I presented a thing that's called the world. And it was a production that looked like this in the source code. So this is the actual source code of the project. It was exactly 1K of um, JavaScript, so 1,024 bytes. And if you run this, you see this in the browser. So it's showing you a spinning world. And the code itself is executing and modifying itself. And it's called a quine. And it shows you a, like a, a spinning globe. Um, Another thing I did is the Mandel code. So this is the, the code itself. So you see a, there's a pre-tag, the script. And once you have this in the browser, you see this. So it outputs itself. And as soon as you click it, it dives into the code and shows you an animated Mandel code for about a minute, um, where it really zooms deep into the, the specific details. Uh, until you reach a limit where you can't have the, the resolution of the uh, numbers that are used in, in JavaScript anymore. So it breaks and getting jitty, and uh, you, know, you see this in a moment, um, where, the, where the code itself breaks apart because the resolution is not high enough. Yeah, I can watch this forever, but there, there's, a, there's a time where it, so it certainly stops. Now you see this, now the numbers are not accurate anymore, and it breaks. Um, Another thing I did is jsfuck.com. You might have heard about this. Um, there were some ideas of this before, and there were some working ex or not working examples, but someone proved that you only need six different characters, these six different characters, to actually write any kind of or any code in JavaScript that you want. 
Um, what I did, I fixed this, work, make it work for Node, for example, and put a website only where you have an input text, where you can say, okay, give me a lot one, and it outputs you the brackets plus and ampersand code, and you can take this without the compiler, put it in the console, and it gives you a lot one. So this is the code that you have to copy. Uh, yeah, quite amazing. I'm not going to show you how I work with this kind of samples, how to minify um, HTML, how to minify JavaScript code. And after this, I'm gonna show you some more examples and something new I did, especially for this conference. But let's start with the HTML, or better, it's dynamic HTML5. So it's the best of like the old and the new world. Um, if you have this template, um, and have a look at this and really think about what is needed here to make something work, uh, then we can figure out, okay, we don't need the doc type. We can skip this. Um, the HTML tags, the surrounding um, needed, we can skip them. Um, if we have a body and include something before the body, it's automatically placed in the head, so we don't need this. Uh, if we do a production and don't want to have a title, we skip this. Um, if we have a script and specify the type text JavaScript, we actually can skip the type because whenever you don't specify the type, the browser will guess it's JavaScript, so reduce this. Um, and then we have the unload handler, which calls the init. If we don't want to use this, we simply put the script at the end of the button, uh, the body, sorry, or we can place it in the onload handler itself. And if we do this, then the body, the closing body tag isn't needed anymore. So we can skip this and only have that. Look short. There, there's, a, there's a way to get it shorter. So you see these uh, quotes and then you have the, the, the text itself or the, the, the code that's at, executed. And if there ain't no quotes in there, you actually can skip the quotes and just say it like that. So this would be the shortest form of like having something running in a browser or like having ex JavaScript executed in a, in a browser. Um, in my examples, I don't wanna like show a dialogue only. I wanted to modify the HTML itself. So I need something to manipulate the, the document. So one way would be to say document write. Um, if you want to have an animation, this doesn't work because it always appends stuff to the body. Um, so we can say document body in a HTML is something, one for example. And to get this shorter, we can actually assign an ID to the body. And, and once, once you do it, you have access to this ID. So this is a global thing that's available, or someone called it a Schrodinger's variable, so sometimes it's there, sometimes not. But actually there, there's, not, there's no need to uh, use document get um, get element by ID or use this uh, jQuery syntax, and you can simply access this without calling that. Um, if, we want, if we want this to be like monospaced, we have to use a pre tag or something like that to make it like all fixed width. And if you look at this, you might see there's a problem because the browser thinks, okay, I'm going to close here the, the tag and it will only show the plus one and doesn't execute the code. Uh, to fix this, we have to get back the quotes. Um, and then if you look at this, there's the space between the ID and the onload uh, attribute. And if you simply replace, or not replace, but switch the order, then we can skip the space and make it like one character short. <laughs> <laughs> this is the things that, that you have to know, but yeah, it's quite fun. Um, <laughs> It looks short, but actually if we totally switch this around, there might be an easier way, or not an easier, but a shorter way to get it. And uh, now we say only a pre-tag with an ID and some script after that. This is like one character shorter than the version before. <laughs> uh, and if you really read the specs, there's something that might be not that much known or not well known. It's the uh, teletype tag. Uh, it's Somewhat like the pre-tag, but doesn't have this, um, it's an inline monospaced tag. Or if you don't care about formatting, you can choose whatever you want. For, for example, tag X, the browser will render it, but it's like 
not want to space them. Yeah. So this was HTML. Now we go into JavaScript. Um, I put together this really simple example. So we have x, y, and z. And we have math random and get the maximum of both values. Uh, we can skip the RAS if we don't care about global leaks. Um, we can assign math to a variable m and reuse this. And we can do the same for the random method and use this. And now it's getting interesting because we could also say, okay, r is a string random and x has this using the square brackets on math itself. It's actually longer, but once you have a look at this, you can move the R thing inside of the first accessor and store this in the R and reuse it for the next time. So this is shorter than the, than the version before. <laughs> um, or we could use evil things like with, uh, with math and simply call the random methods on there. And once you do this, you can skip the, um, the curly brackets if you use commas. And do the same trick that, that we've done before. And if you place this in one line, we have this at the end. So this is like to give you an idea how to reduce the code step by step to get it really down. Um, OK. Some more examples. Um, I was like trying different things. <coughs> Sorry. And I realized that once you have like tiny code, it's totally cool to do something like what I call the death star. Um, you can actually put spaces where you want and make this align somehow. And this is an HTML page. And this is like a valid HTML. It's not, it has global leaks, of course. Um, but it's a valid HTML um, page that you can run in your browser and it will execute an alert which says XSS. And if you look close, um, there's the body unload in the top and all the rest is like um, code that's written in Cyrillic, so the, the Russian alphabet, and it will give you an alert that's looking like this. Um, I played around with different things and I was the first, I think, who uses uh, Hebrew to write JavaScript and actually you have to flip this, so you read it from right to left. Uh, so you see some assignments and it goes down and it also gives you an alert one in the browser. It's quite funny and if you focus on this, you realize, okay, you have to think different and if you want to check this out on a website, type in this URL, but remember to uh, do it by right to left or use the shortcut Hebrew to, to get there. Yeah. And as we are in Asia, I also did some experiments that I want to show. It's like half a year ago or something like this, where I used Japanese katakana characters. And I also like wrote something, it's always the same, basically. But once you lay out this thing, you can create something that looks like it's written from top to down. So this looks like columns, but actually I use tabs to align them. And um, the, the impression that you get is like that you have different columns. But you can copy this one by one into the console and it gives you an alert form. Yeah, quite cool, but once you look too much into this kind of code, um, you might see, oops, sorry, go back, because this is important. No, sorry. My keynote doesn't handle movies anymore, that's good. So let's check this out. Okay. So once you stare at the code, you realize, okay, you're somehow lost in the, into the matrix, and uh, it's crazy. Yeah. This is important, as I said, because I wanted to create something that looks like the matrix. So if you, if you have a look at this raining code thing, then you realize, okay, this is source code somewhere, but it doesn't, look, uh, doesn't use Latin characters. It uses some Asian characters and numbers, and that's it. So I did the research, and um, yeah, I always start like, by, by Googling cool project that uses the same idea, and I found, found some something by Ryan Hensey, and he did this nice canvas animation where you have this code coming, coming down. And I had a look at the code, which was really well written and optimized already. 
And the basic idea here was to, okay, have something, a field style, green, then add some characters at specific positions, and then to, to get this effect, he sets the field style to um, something black, but with a really low opacity, and put in this black uh, thing on top of it. So once you done this in, in an animation, you see it's getting like, darker and darker, but you still have this thing in the background. And if you look at the code, you see, okay, there are some, uh, some repeating things that you can get out, and you actually put everything in a, in a, in a string and replace this um, with what we've seen before. The code itself is only 352 characters long, and I did what I'm good at and reduced it by about 100 characters to have the same effect, and I added something back to it. So some cool things that I missed, for example, I used different characters, I used um, also white flashing characters, and I have something matrix like an attack in a, in a button. And the final thing will look like this somehow. i later show you this in an animation or how it works, but first let's have a look at the code. So this is the code, and once you read this, you realize, okay, there are so many like Latin characters or English words that we use here. And I ask myself, um, how do we write JavaScript um, without Latin characters? And this is fun. <laughs> um, there are actually two ways. One way would be to use, um, in the end it's like mixing both of them, one way would be to use escape sequences and the other way would be to play Scrabble. I'll later explain you what's, what this is about. Um, but if you have an A, for example, we can also use um, Unicode escape sequences and say backslash U and then put a four digit hexadecimal code behind this. And in JavaScript, it's interpreted as an A. Um, you can like combine them and have this, for example, if you put this into the console and run it, it's a lot warm. So it has the characters behind and it executes. Um, that's cool because it also works with any Unicode characters that you have. For example, with this character, I think it's rain. Um, so it's backslash uh, U96E8. Um, so this would be one way. Another way would be to use um, hexadecimal um, writing so you have a backslash x and then put some hexadecimal code. Um, the thing is that it's only working for strings, so it's not working for regular code, and you are only allowed to put in um, characters lower than, like in the, in the ASCII range, so no, there's no way to, to express um, Unicode characters. And one thing most people don't know about is, and, then, and I came uh, by this like some weeks ago, is if you just have a backslash and then two to three numbers, then it's interpreted as, as um, an octal escape sequence. So you can use numbers from zero to, uh, from zero to seven, seven and have this octal representation of the ASCII code. And um, this gives you back A again. Yeah, that's quite cool because this is the first thing where you don't have any Latin characters in anymore. And you can combine this into this. So um, I'm gonna show what's going on here. So here are like many numbers, octal sequences, and behind these numbers there are actually strings, or like a combination of characters. And if you place this in one line, you see this thing. And this is something really powerful. And um, to show you, we access map on an empty array. We could also have like filter or something, filter, sort, split, whatever. Uh, but map is a really short thing to use. And this is actually a function. And if we have a function, we can access the constructor of the function. And this is the function constructor. So, and this is, I'm not sure if you know this, but you can pass any kind of strings to a function constructor and it will 
generate a function for you. You can also like put um, arguments in front of this and it will evaluate once you execute it. So basically what we have here is now an eval function, but we, without calling eval. Yeah, that's super cool and super powerful. Okay, another way which is quite fun to use is playing Scrabble with JavaScript. I'm gonna explain you why I call this Scrabble. Um, this is something really basic. So if you have an array and you say not array, so if you do a negation, then you get false back. If you do a double negation, you get true back. That should be clear. If you then add an empty string to it, then you get the string false or the string true. And now the fun thing starts, because what you can do is you can access uh, different, at different position, different characters. So you get T, R, U, E, if you get the first, second, third, and fourth position, and you can combine them in different orders and access them, uh, like put them and access it on, on other elements. Um, and if you do this, for example, false, false, two, true, one, two, three, one, zero, and if you shift this, then you see, okay, we have alert here. <laughs> And you combine the strings and you can put this into the eval method that we've seen before. So this is really cool and this is what I call Scrabble. So you can, you have access to false, object, true, undefined and that's enough to like have a couple of characters and once you have these characters you can combine them into like a more bigger sense. Um, the one thing that you need to get is the constructor. So this is possible here and then if you have an array and call the constructor, it's a function, and if you call the constructor on the same thing, then you get something to execute your code. So basically what you have here is the same ability that we've seen before. Okay, and how many time do I have left? 24 minutes? Okay. Um, so this will be the, the, the final thing that I'm, I'm gonna show here. Uh, this is the, the, the matrix code. I call it rain because it's, it's calling the um, raining code sequence. And um, this is the source code itself. So this is, oh, we have the HTML tags, we still need this and you can't replace it with um, other tags, but the source code uh, is um, in Asian letters, I mean. And on the top, this is something we have to use here too. We have to just define uh, it's the chance at UTF-8, otherwise the browser will not like render this correctly. Which is a pity in my opinion, UTF-8 should be the default, but it is not. But um, yeah, we have to use it here. And then you see, okay, we have an ID with the rain um, kanji, and we can access this like this, um, like we've seen before inside of the code. This is the JavaScript, and it, you might see it from the, from the layout, it's like there are different parts here. The, the first part is assigning um, the, the letters, so like grabbing different letters, and instead of storing this into A, B, C, D, I use hiragana in this case, so the first hiragana is uh, an empty string, then we have a false, true, and whatever, and then it's getting the different characters. Um, then we have something here, this is an encoded string. It's a string that's later decoded by the code that follows, and it's encoded into kanjis. And the final thing is to, to encode these characters and give you back the encoded version that could be evaluated. Yeah. Okay, let's start with the uh, encoding here. Oh, actually, it's the decoding. So if we escape this character, I think it's slow, the meaning of this. Um, if we escape this, we get back um, percent %u6162. It's like the Unicode um, uh, encoding thing, but with, with um, percent sign. And if we then replace the percent %u with an empty string, we get back just the numbers. So this is the first thing we do. The next would be to split every second, or like split the whole, whole string by two characters and put an X in front of this. So you get back 
backslash x61 backslash x62. And if you eval this, then you get back a string, in this case, AB. So it's quite cool because we have um, a Unicode symbol which actually uses like more than one byte and we can split this up into two bytes of, of uh, Latin characters and like encode both of them into this and the escape and replace logic is only like several bytes long. Um, another thing that I had to do is a four level inception of eval. Uh, I'm gonna explain this in a moment but we have some, some strange looking kanjis in there. And the first thing I did is using this escape thing. And because we can't get the P out of the Scrabble thing, we have to use the um, backslash um, syntax to get the octal version of this. And if you eval this, then you get back the escape with the replace thing. And if you get back this, then you have to, what I explained before, and in the first level, we have the alert one that will be executed. Yeah, it's strange, but uh, it's really fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> and the final thing will look like this. So this is the first time I'm gonna show this. I did some sneak previews uh, for some friends, but um, the final animation is this. Yeah. So. It's all done in 1,000 characters. Or not. It, actually, it's like 500 characters. The bytes is like 1, 1K. And if you really look close, and I'm stopping the animation, so this is the source code itself. So it outputs the source and um, uses the canvas to lay out um, symbols to make it look like the matrix. Yeah, and you can find this here or use the matrix shortcut, it will redirect to, to the location. And yeah, that's basically it. The only question that most people ask me is, why do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> Not only when, but why? And there, there are many reasons, in my opinion, and the five most important reasons are, first of all, it's super fun to do. So you, you're doing this and you have fun together with other people and you think about something and tweak your own code. The next thing is that you, you see your limits in the first place, but then you know oh, I have to like bypass these limits. I have to look deeper and uh, learn how to do it right. And, and you, you set your own limits by this character, or amount of characters or amount of bytes and you force yourself really to think about how to do it. And this is important because you have to focus on the, 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 the most easiest idea, not, not the most easiest idea, but the most easiest implementation. Or reduce the idea that you can do it in this amount of characters. And one thing that you also learn is like these, these hidden parts of the language, or the language itself that you usually don't use during your daytime job. You find out more things how you can use not only hacks, but really useful things uh, which you might never have heard about. And it, in my opinion, brings back like a really good community. So whenever I put this online with a, with a I have this idea to do this, people from all over the world like reply to my tweets or I reply to them and people come together and they hack all together on one single project. And that's super cool. And that's it, basically. So, thanks. Um, I put together all the slides and um, upload the presentation. And yeah, so check out my website, m1k, or tweet me at mk, and that's it. And we can do some Q&A. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. That's really awesome because I'm very sure that apart from Latin characters, many of us know a second language or a third language that we can play with. Yeah. So any questions on that? Maybe you know Japanese or, or uh, other Hebrew characters that you want to play with? Or even JS1K for the...
one of it. Like uh, Jan was saying, because don't do boring stuff, do fun stuff. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, I yeah. wonder if the code on the website is optimal or if you can further uh, improve the result okay. by hand. Yeah. So the question was, uh, to repeat it, um, the, the JSPAC website, um, it uses the same concept as you've seen before with the Scrabble thing. So it gets characters from somewhere and puts this together. And the question was if the, the code itself is optimum or optimized, or if you can reduce it further. And as I spent with these kind of projects for more than a year now, I see it, I, I'm pretty sure it can be reduced to a, maybe a 1% of the original code. So currently you have this, a lot one in about 2,000 characters, and once you put in jQuery, the whole browser will bloat because you can't handle this anymore. And there's an easy way to fix this, but I need some time to do it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yes, Joshua, of course. <laughs> you did JS K before. Uh, Martin, great stuff as usual. Um, actually, I learned a lot of uh, JS golfing stuff from you online. Um, my question is this, um, how often do you look at code you have written in the past and do you wonder like, uh, what do that mean? <laughs> or do you kind of like keep like, the unminified version somewhere? For, for this project or for my daily work? For your, I mean for your, for your codes which you minify to, to release. Yeah. So maybe to, to separate, I don't use this during my day job. Or <laughs> <laughs> Just to make clear. Um, and the other thing is, if you want to write this kind of code, the original code has to be really super strict, um, like aligned. So it's, there's, I have some tools where, it, like, um, where I get to the minified version, but I always keep the original code, or at least until some point, and then you do some manual optimizations, like shifting characters to, to make it really fit. Yeah. But usually, I try to stay on the road with the original unmanifying version as long as I can. Great, maybe uh, one more? Uh, just curious, have you tried the image JS before? It's like uh, loading a JavaScript, uh, injecting a JavaScript into an image file. Yes, I've, I've been working on a project. Oh. I have this in a presentation last year, I think. Um, that's a cool way to, to use a P, the PNG format and the PNG compression of an image to actually get your code down really well. So it's way better than do it by hand and you can use repeating string and the PNG compression algorithm packs this into an image. And you can add something to the end of the PNG which is actually HTML. And inside of this HTML you put in some, some code. And if you load this PNG as an HTML file, and have an image that loads itself, so the PNG, you can analyze this and use this compression. It's a super cool thing, and uh, you should check out my talk from last year. Yeah. All right, thank okay. you, Martin. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Thanks.